when it comes to managing the upside profit target decisions, you know, it's a funny thing because I, I don't know how many people here consciously think about what the risk-reward ratio is of their trade. And, and, and remember that we're talking about you know, the whole month, and last month too for that matter, we've been talking about everything in light of the, the EA that I've been developing. So for those of you that haven't been joining us, everything's kind of been in the spirit of I'm in this process of building an EA based upon my grab candles and my 34 EMA wave. And we're really just kind of looking at the rules that will govern this EA. In a lot of ways, you guys have been part of this process because the rules that I've been discussing have been really what's going to be built into the end product. So with that in mind, one of the things that I've been thinking about is how do I determine, and this is the real question of risk reward, how do I determine whether I can afford the trade? Now, I don't know how many people think about risk reward in this, in this way, because for me, the risk reward answers this question. How can I, you know, whether I can afford the trade. So let's start with risk, all right? In terms of looking at risk specifically, everything for me boils down to initially asking myself where an entry is no longer valid. And this is what I call the point of validity. Now, in terms of programming this into the EA, which is a trend following EA, it's been fairly simple. If it's an uptrend, my point of validity is just below, three to five pips below, the 34 period EMA on the low. In a downtrend, the point of validity is three to five pips below the 34 period EMA high. Okay. Now, the trend, if you guys joined us for some of the earlier talks this month, the trend itself, because it's nearly impossible for me to tell an EA I want a certain angle. I haven't found one that's very consistent, although, you know, who knows? When the programmers get their hands on this and they start incorporating look back and market memory, maybe they will be able to, to finagle some sort of consistent way of, of taking a clock angle. But right now, clock angles are very subjective in this realm of automation. All right. What is more objective is using my grab candles. And we talked about kind of the calculation of successive red or green with certain push to higher highs or lower lows. And how I can identify a trend using successive grab candles. Okay, we talked about that in the past discussion. Now, one of the things that I, I need everybody here to remember is, you know, this is in the process of being, you know, built. This isn't something that I've got built right now. This is something that I'm sharing with you in terms of how I'll be building. And because of that, you know, this is kind of the first run, and we'll continue to tweak this as we, you know, as I learn more about what I do and don't want in the system in this EA. 
Now, one of the things that I hope that everybody thinks about, whether it's an automated trade like what we're talking about or whether it's a discretionary trade, is going back to, can I afford this trade? Now, affording a trade has nothing to do with whether or not it's a good setup. There are plenty of good setups that are simply just not affordable. So we might have a, a trade that's setting up on a daily time frame. And because where the point of validity is might represent too great a loss for an individual's account. So even though the trade might be fantastic, the setup's clean, the wave angle has great clarity, and all the other things we look for, it just simply might represent too much risk, regardless of the reward. Because we always have to say, think, think to ourselves, yeah, everybody can afford a good trade, right? That's kind of ridiculous, but everybody can afford a good trade. What happens if things go against you? Can you afford being stopped out? And if you can't afford being stopped out, the trade is not appropriate for you. It has nothing to do with the quality of the trade. It has everything to do with the risk of the trade. Now, we do have ways to work around that, and, and we've talked about it in past webinars throughout the year, this idea of a cheated and stop loss. But remember, I don't know whether or not, and maybe this is something we'll, we'll build in, which is a cheated and stop loss option. Is there a way that I can put into the system that, on a particular trade, I want to manually set a different stop loss. You know, these are all things that I'm looking to program into the, the EA. Things like whether or not I want to be able to use a 20 period simple moving average as an aggro swing entry. Things like whether or not I want to be able to, like we're talking about right now, cheat in a stop. Okay? So these are all things we're going to have to consider, and these are all things that at some point, maybe the first version or maybe later versions, we're going to build into it. So as you're, if you ever go into the process of building your own EA, you probably know there are conservative versions of an entry, and there might be more aggressive versions of the entry that you're looking at. And, and how much of that flexibility do you want to program into, into the EA? Okay. In this case, specifically speaking, from the risk standpoint, do I want that, as I said, that cheated in option, all right, that cheated in stop loss option. And I'm definitely thinking about it. I haven't quite determined what it is that I'll, uh, I'll program in. My guess is right now it's going to be some sort of manual setting actually be able to put in a price and say, okay, this is my cheated and stop loss. In lieu of, in the, in the case of a trending market, the 34 EMA low in, a, in an uptrend, the 34 EMA high in a downtrend. Okay, so we tackle a couple of the questions that have popped up on the text window. And the first one is, I don't like to risk more than 1% of the account. And certainly position sizing is going to be it's going to be up to the individual as far as how many lots you want to put into the trade that's going to be part of the EA that's going to be completely up to the individual and and I and I agree George you know as far as risking more than one percent um, you know that's I'll tell you what it's interesting and I'm glad you mentioned that George because it's a great it's a great topic for for a risk management webinar and and it's interesting to me that how the one or two percent or one and a half percent has become a stop loss for a lot of traders. You know, it's interesting where people tell me they'll use a 2% stop loss. And I don't know how much I agree with, with that. I think what's interesting is 2% or 1%, these could be what I call uncle points. In other words, this is where you decide whether or not a trade is affordable, right? whether that's 1% or 2%, that's your uncle. That's where you say, okay, no, this is not for me. But I don't think that 1% or 2% is a stop loss. Okay? Just my opinion, 
but I don't think it's a stop loss. And, and I know that's not what you mentioned either, but I'm just talking generally speaking because I see that all the time. Oh, 1% stop loss or 2% stop loss. And I'll be frank with you and everybody here in the room, it makes me insane when people start talking about these percentage-based stop losses. I do not believe in fixed PIP or percentage-based stop losses. Okay, I don't believe in those. Because this idea of a point of validity means that I knew where the trade I knew where the trade is valid and therefore I know where the trade is not valid. So let's think about validity for a moment and then we'll define what a point of validity is. So if I know the validity for a, since these are trend following, is a trend following EA, and for those of you who are not familiar with the word EA, that, that just stands for expert advisor. Expert advisor is a program in essence that runs on your MT4 it runs on your MT4 platform and it automates anything from simply entry signals okay all the way to full automation and anything in between now when I say full automation I mean execution the whole bit okay so it's like a program that runs within it, for those of you that are that not familiar. So part of my process of you know, this, this description to the program is, is, okay, I know where my trade is valid. In the case of an uptrend, and we talked about this during the entry part of the discussion we were having, in the case of an uptrend, it's basically 20 period SMA, which is aggro, and 34 period EMA high. For the downtrend, Again, it's the 20 period SMA and the 34 period EMA low. All right. So that's where my entry is. That's the validity of my trade. Within the context of a trend, if I reach those levels, it triggers an entry for us. The point of validity for an uptrend then is the opposite side of the wave, which means 34 period EMA low. And I don't want to put my stop loss right at that 34 period EMA low. I want to put it three to five pips below that level. And the, because remember, that POV is actually support, right? I don't want to put it right at support, I want to put it just below support. Does that make sense? So in the case of a downtrend, my POV is the 34 period EMA high, and I want to put that 3 to 5 pips above. Okay? Now that's easy enough to program into the EA. And of course we'll have an override for cheated in. We will even have an override for what, 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 if we decide that we want to give this trade a little bit more room to wiggle because it's a major double zero psychological level or some sort of Fibonacci or some other reason where we think there might be support or resistance that's stronger at another level. I'll have, a, I'll have an override, so we don't have to use necessarily that setting. But for the most part, that's the setting that I watch. That's my point of validity. All right. So having said all that, if I, you know, as I'm a discretionary trader, these are my rules. So this is what I want to build into my EA. And I, and I kind of started this with a little bit of a, you know, we started on with this idea of 
this one to two percent. Well, if that point of validity is greater than, and we'll call this my uncle, okay? Whatever my uncle percentage is, or uncle uh, number of pips. And when I say uncle, I mean like, you know, you ever, uh, you know, with, with, with kids when they're, they're torquing each other's arm or whatever it is, they say uncle, that's enough. Uncle is just enough, right? For those of you that are, are not familiar with that term, when I say my uncle point, okay? Um, I'm sure that doesn't translate everywhere. That's just, wh where have you had enough? Where is it no longer affordable? So the POV, the point of validity, is greater than the percentage that I'm willing to risk on any particular trade. It's not a valid setup. So again, that's another criteria that we can input. If the risk is greater than, you know, X number, X percentage, or X number of pips, the EA will not fire off the trade. Okay. So again, I, I oftentimes will see people talk about a percentage that they're willing to risk on a trade, and oftentimes that just becomes the stop loss. Not everybody, but I see that very, very often. I see it written about in the magazines and so forth and books. It's just, it seems to be a common error a lot of traders make. Okay, what I'm trying to make sure is everyone differentiates between what is an affordable trade and then using the support or resistance on the chart and, and furthermore this idea of a point of validity to define where the trade is no longer valid rather than some very, you know, by the way, if you use a dollar amount or a percentage or a number of pips, Realize that that doesn't necessarily have any basis in the support and resistance on the chart. It just might be an individualized threshold for, for pain, for loss, for risk, right? But to me, if I'm using support or resistance to get me in the trade, I want to use it to get out, okay? That's, that's you know, hopefully what I'm, I'm trying to get across to you all. Don't make the error of using that fixed pip or percentage where the trade is either affordable or not, don't let that become, in essence, your stop loss, too. Okay? So I'm, I'm with you, George. I think we have to have some sort of point at which we say we can't afford the trade, whether that's 1%, 1.5%, 2%, whatever that is, I think it's very wise to have that in mind and then determine whether the point of validity works within that. Okay, and time frame absolutely will, will, make a, will make a difference, you know, because daily charts, just by their virtue of their typically being larger setups, in other words, the, the distance between my 34 EMA high and low on, say, a 15-minute chart and the difference between the 34 EMA high and low on a daily chart could be an enormous number of pips. And because of that, just by virtue of the time frame and the distance between high and low on the wave, I'll have a completely different risk. And typically speaking, longer term time frames entail greater risk. All right. And also potentially greater reward. All right. So in terms of, and I hope I, I drive, okay, let's see, I'll make sure I wrote this in rough up. Uh, Wrote this right uptrend, 20 period. All right, so I think, yes, there we go. So I, I believe I did, if I, if I misspoke earlier, I believe I did type it in correctly there. So uh, Merrily, thank you. If I misspoke, I apologize. So, again, we're putting together two tools that I've been using on a discretion, in a discretionary way for years, my 34 EMA wave and my green, red, and blue candles, 
which are the grab candles. By the way, you can download those tools at ibfx.com forward slash tools forward slash grab. Okay, those are available for free download. And George, you're right. Absolutely, we can use micros, minis, full size. That's absolutely something we can do to control risk. In fact, I tell a lot of people they shouldn't even think about full size lot trading until they're trading, in my opinion, 10 or 15 minis. You know, 10 minis gives you a lot of flexibility versus one full size, but it's the same, same value. Absolutely. Absolutely, George. So, Debbie, I hope I answered your question there as far as the stop loss because it's the setup that determines it. Okay. It's a setup that determines my my stop loss. We'll read a couple more questions here. Um, cheated in. Great question, Doug. Yes, I, I talked about The, the uh, cheated in stop, and Debbie, this might apply, I guess, to your question as well, as, as far as the stop loss, if you're doing some sort of manual setting. A cheated in stop loss, this idea of recognizing what the point of validity is, but saying, you know what, I can't afford it. What happens then? What if you can't afford the point of validity, but you want to take the trade? Okay? Again, the, the point at which the trade is no longer valid. I defined it already within the context of an up and down trend, which is what this EA is, is looking to, to capitalize on. So a cheated in stop is then saying, you know what, I want to use a, a separate setting, hopefully using some sort of support or resistance, and you'll, you'll manually put in a stop loss that typically represents less risk than the point of validity. Okay, the point of validity, again, assumes you know why you're getting in the trade. And if you know the reasoning for why you're getting in the trade, you know the reason why you're not getting, uh, why, you're, why you're not going to be wanting to stay in the trade any longer. You know, a really good example is typically a triangle. Let me see if I can find a triangle pattern. That's one of the easiest ways to describe the, the point of validity. It's one of the easiest examples. Let me see if I can find a triangle pattern. Uh, not a lot of consolidation going on in these markets, but let's see if we can find one. If not, I'll just draw one in. You know what, let's just do that. It'll probably be easier. So I'm just going to use some empty space here on this chart. And Let's just draw a triangle here. Okay, so here's a triangle. All right, let's imagine that prices are moving within it. Okay. Gosh, I would really like to find a triangle, though. I don't know if we have one or not. Actually, you know what? We might be able to kind of... Okay, here we go. There we go. Fantastic. Here's a triangle. Not, not, not great triangles, but this is, this is a good example of when a triangle would be valid. Okay. We have a market that's going sideways, flat 34 EMA wave. We have downtrend lines creating a triangle pattern, okay? So what I'm talking about in terms of point of validity is that if I know why I look for a buy entry, in this case, look for a reason to get long through the resistance of the downtrend lines, How can a breakout on a triangle still be valid if it breaks down through support? That's the gist of point of validity. Think about it for a moment. Again, if I have a breakout of a triangle, a break higher through resistance, if prices come back within the range of the triangle, that's fine. But if prices move down through support, can I, can I still say the breakout is valid? In my opinion, that's no. I, I, cannot, I cannot say that a breakdown 
would not invalidate the breakout. Does, does that make sense to everybody? I think, it, again, I just think this is, a, this is a good example of this idea of point of validity. What type of price movement would invalidate your entry, the rationale for your entry? Okay? And that's what the point of validity is. Where are the reasons that you got in the market no longer valid? So if I wanted to cheat in a stop loss, in this case, let's say this triangle for whatever reason, I know it's a very short term time frame, but let's say this was a very large triangle and the risk represented too, too, much, too much of a potential loss to my account. If I were to keep the trade, if it moved down lower in the range. Let's say the risk was just too great if I took the breakout I didn't want to sit through the potential loss of breaking down through support. What I could then do is use a, a near-term low and cheat in my stop by saying, you know what, I know that this is not a point of validity. I know the triangle breakout could still be valid if prices re-enter the range of the triangle, but I'm not willing to sit through prices trading down below the uptrend line support. So I'll place it somewhere within the range of the triangle below some sort of near-term support level. That would be a cheated in stop. Notice I did not bring percentage into the discussion or number of pips or even dollars into the discussion. Okay? At some point, you obviously will have to consider that. I'm not ignoring that. But I would rather you focus on the support and resistance on the chart before you override it with some dollar requirement. All right, so everybody here, I'm going to go grab a quick drink of water. I woke up with a scratchy throat this morning. I'm going to grab a quick drink of water. If you want to do the same, feel free to do that, and, and, we'll, and we'll come right back with a with, with discussion, okay? Okay, so let's keep going through some of these questions, and we'll start talking about the reward side, okay? You know, I think it's first important to determine what you can afford risk-wise before you even jump to the, the reward or the upside targets, okay? So one thing I hope that we're driving through is the fact that we're using support and resistance, whether it be indicator-based or price-based, we're using support or resistance to get in and out of the trade. All right? So let me read through a few more of these questions, and we'll get to the reward side of the equation.
You know, as far as the 50 period simple, uh, Sean, you know, the 50 period simple is fine too. You know, if that, that's a level that you watch and it's being respected by price action. Um, certainly, you know, you could use alternate moving averages, 20, 50, 100, 200. Those are all very psychologically significant settings for sure. So I'm not giving you a sum, you know, a complete list in terms of your your options. There are other fantastic options, and and certainly you know, 50 would be would be fine if you notice that it's giving you uh, if it's it's being respected by price action. So certainly I wouldn't rule it out. It's just not one that I use a lot, to be quite frank. Okay. But it's certainly valid if you feel that it's 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 being respected, and the same thing goes for the wave. You know, part of the clarity equation, if you guys recall from earlier conversations, is clarity starts with a clear clock ankle reading, then going to the smoothness of the moving average lines, then going to how established are those moving average lines, you know, in that clock angle, and then finally uh, determining if there is a test of that wave. Are, are, is there dynamic support or resistance at that level? In other words, are, are prices respecting the dynamic support in an uptrend or the dynamic resistance in a downtrend of the 34 EMA wave? Absolutely. So the same criteria would apply to any, any set of moving averages. Absolutely. As far as a percentage stop loss, you know, I again, there's a lot of art. As far as the way people use them, I've seen them used in a number of ways, whether it be for leverage, whether it be for position sizing, whatever it is. Um, I've seen it also commonly used for stop losses. So it's been discussed in many, in many ways for many uses. The one I was talking about specifically were the 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 idea where there's a 2% stop loss or a 1% stop loss. Okay, the word stop loss and, and leverage, look, a stop loss is a stop loss. It's the order at which we put in to exit a trade when things go wrong. I agree with the other point, um, Noam, where discussing the percentage in terms of position sizing or, or, or leverage, that, that certainly is a good, a good decision uh, for traders who, who want to use that type of calculation for position sizing. I typically don't. I don't. I don't use a calculation for position sizing, but it is certainly that would be a, a good use of it. But I've seen it in many many times used as actually a stop loss. Not you know again stop loss and leverage. I, I guess maybe I didn't quite understand your statement or your question there, but uh, the w the way I was referring to it was the capacity with which I've seen it many times discussed as the actual stop loss level. And again, it's, it's, it's really individualized, but I don't want anybody thinking 1% or 2% is where they should put their stop. All right, so let's see. In terms of point of validity, hopefully I've defined that. Uh, as far as stop loss and percentages, again, I, I think it's very wise to consider how much leverage you're using. I'm sure most people are sitting somewhere around 50 to 1. I think it's why it's stateside anyways. It's wise to consider it within the within the scope of your um, your, your position sizing obviously. That those are all individualized decisions that, you know, I don't and again, going back to the EA application. You know, those are going to be individual choices because the actual position sizing is going to be something that I'm not going to set. Uh, the EA will allow you to set what your position sizing will be. So uh, if there is a if there's a trade setting up, you know, you'll have to go in and manually override it. These are all considerations that, you know, again, I'm I'm struggling with in many ways because I know that not every trade is going to have the same position sizing. So how do I go ahead and control that? Or, or have some sort of function where I can increase or decrease the position sizing? You know, what if I don't happen to catch the trade in the process of development? How do I go in and manually switch it if I'm not actually at the, at the desk? Because the whole point of the EA is to let it run when I'm not necessarily at the desk. So I think 
the discussion, and it's certainly a good point that many of you bring up, which is, is there going to be some sort of, of setting where we can make a generalized kind of EA, general, generalized EA setting for, you know, say six lots, eight lots, ten lots, but if the risk is greater than your account size, not to take the trade. If the risk is greater than, you know, X amount of pips to take a smaller position, those are all things I'm going to have to consider. Those are really great points. And, and again, this is why this discussion has been so helpful because there are so many things that I want to be able to tweak because what you guys bring up are great points. Like Noam uh, brought up and uh, some questions by Debbie and George. The and Sean, what's interesting is there's so many individualized aspects to our, our wishes to take our discretionary selves and automate it. So how do I ask all the right questions and have answers for the EA so it can be as Roggy-like as possible or as, you know, wh whoever's operating it, how could it be customized to mimic their desires for trend following using grab and wave with these with these smaller details that would make it like they're at their computer, but they're not really. You know, that's where you really have to ask the right kind of questions. You guys are asking terrific questions here. And quite frankly, for some of them, from the standpoint of the EA, you know, I'm not sure how we're going to make that happen yet. But you guys bring up great points for certain. Okay, so let's see. Uh, as far as the profit-taking side, okay, here's where right now, I'm really leaning towards utilizing psychological levels. Because remember, I'm not at my desk. I'm not in a position necessarily to tell the system that there was past support or resistance at a particular number or there's a Fibonacci at a particular number. I don't even know that we can automate that consistently. So obviously there'll be an override where if you want to manually put in for a particular trade, that the stop loss will be at a certain level and that the profit target will be at a certain level too. Terrific, we can do that. But in terms of a, a more generalized automated setting, I'm really leaning towards psychological levels, mainly the 50 and the double zero. So we may be able to have a minor psychological level feature where if you check that box off, it'll recognize 20 and 80 pip levels, but generally speaking, it'll step out in front of the double zero in the 50s. That's definitely one aspect of the system that I'm, I'm certainly considering. Because the problem with Fibonacci is it's such a subjective tool. The system would have to automate that process as well. And not that that's not out of the question, but now we're talking about a completely different set of automation requirements. Okay. Yeah, Sean, and, and, and uh, as an aside, Sean, you brought up silver. Yeah, I've been trading the heck out of the YI and the SI contracts in silver. Absolutely. You know, a trend is a trend, and I, I don't feel the 34 EMA wave is limited to the Forex market. I use it for stocks. I use it for futures, obviously. So, yeah, I'm with you. It, it has been amazing. As has, it's been the same, very effective in gold as well. So uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, Noam, you, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Noam. Um, you're absolutely right. We can't force the market to respect our account. You're 100% right about that. But we have to respect our account, right? Um, we need to, and you're right, part of the question of can I afford the trade is that respect, that we have to acknowledge that there is a certain amount of risk we can accept for our account. And if we cannot accommodate it, as you uh, that's a great uh, thing. We need to accommodate it, but if we can't afford to accommodate it, we don't even want to enter that trade. So we always have to assume risk. I mean, that's what trading is to me. Absolutely. However, and size is one way to do it, but if we have someone who's looking to enter a daily chart and sometimes on a daily chart, we could have 80, 90, 100 pips of risk. And even for someone with a very small 
mini account, that might be too much risk. So sometimes it's even beyond the scope of position sizing. Sometimes it goes into simply the trade is not affordable, regardless of our position size. And, and everybody has different risk tolerances. I'm not here to judge whether or not someone is risk tolerant enough. I think the tolerance for risk goes back to the three C's. And I know new traders may not have developed the confidence to let a trade or a market move enough. I think it's a process. It's a development of, it's the development of a trader. And, and to get to that point where we have the confidence to let a market move uh, has a lot to do with, with the three C's. I think a lot of it also has to do with directional bias. I know for myself, when there's a clear trend on the chart, like we have on the, right now, on the Euro US dollar, on the Aussie, on the Kiwi, on a number of charts, we have a very clear directional bias on the daily time frame. You know, one pair right now, which is kind of giving me fits, is the dollar yen. Okay, the dollar yen really doesn't have a very clear directional bias on the daily. So when I'm taking my intraday trades, I don't have the same confidence that I have, for example, when I'm trading my Euro US dollar. Now, I'm, I'm very confident in, in most of my long positions intraday on the Euro US dollar because there is a clear dominant psychology on this on this pair and it's it's bullish. So I think a lot of position sizing, the size that you decide to enter your trade with, I think a lot of it it's beyond the scope of simply plugging it into a formula. I think a lot of it for many traders, especially new traders, is is confidence. And and to me a lot of my confidence for following a trend, again we're talking specifically trend following in the EA here comes from comes from a clear directional bias. So, you know, look at the look at the trends on the Aussie, the Euro, the Swissy, the Canada. We're starting to get some clarity bullishly on the cable where we've had a transition that seems to be uh, indicating that we could really start pushing to higher highs. We'll see. You know, it's not quite what we're seeing on some other pairs. Okay, but it's trying to it's trying to really give us some some clarity and some a more of an established wave angle. But when you compare the cable to, for example, the Aussie, completely different discussion, right? The Aussie is much more established than, say, the cable. Or take a look at the Canada. There's definitely more of an established downturn on the Canada. But, I mean, you look at the trends on the Swissy and the Euro right now, very clear directional bias. And I love this discussion, gang. This is this is terrific. Okay, got a question here in terms of the point of validity at a set time of trade and okay, or is it dynamic? Okay, so if I have a point of validity that is based upon the the wave, obviously it's dynamic. If I have a point of validity based upon a psychological level, a price level like that, Fibonacci even a pivot, that's static. So it depends on what the tool is. And obviously the system would account for the, the, EA, the, the EA would account for the, e, the 34 EMA movement for sure. Um, for those, oh, by the way, I believe it's going to come out in the next couple of weeks. We're actually releasing a best of the Daily Trading Edge from the Interbank FX website. And there'll be a free PDF that'll be available to everybody. Um, I believe probably by the end of the year, I'll make a decision as to whether I'm going to write another book yet or not. Um, but, you know, really everything that I teach and all my tools, everything's available through Interbank FX in terms of Daily Trading Edge or past webinars and, and so forth. But you can go to Amazon and, and search my name and you'll see the books that I have. But I, before you buy anything, I'll tell you, just utilize the tools that I have online with the blogs, whether it be my personal blog, the Daily Trading Edge, or the brand new website, the Daily Trading Forex Trading Edge, Daily Trading Daily Forex Trading Edge.com. So as far as profit targets, again, 
I don't want to utilize levels that are going to require the system to calculate subjective, subjective tools like Fibonacci. Um, pivots are fine, but I'm not a big fan. I'm a huge fan of psychological levels. And that's where I'm leaning towards right now. The majors, obviously the double zero and the 50. And then there'll be likely an option for the minors, which is the 20 and the 80. Okay. The subjectivity about a Fibonacci, well, if the EA is calculating it, you're right. That once the EA puts it out there, that's not subjective. But the, I'm talking about the calculation in particular. Okay, anybody who's used Fibonacci for any length of time knows that finding the last major move, finding the high and low from which the Fibonacci will be drawn can be subjective. That's what I'm talking about. Once levels are on your chart, that's fine, but you got to question how the levels are being calculated. And the calculation of Fibonacci is incredibly subjective. It's a subjective tool because I've actually got some plugins on my eSignal charts that automate Fibonacci, but I still have to let it know how far back into the percentage of price movement to even look for minor highs and minor lows. There could be multiple minor highs and minor lows which represent a rally or a sell-off. That's where the, the Fibonacci is, is extremely subjective. It's a subjective calculation as far as identifying those two, those two spots, the high and the low from which the Fibonacci is pulled. And <laughs> we can go round and round about whether it's subjective or objective, obviously. In my experience, trying calculating this for many years, identifying what a clean last major move is is still something that I find is incredibly difficult to, to calculate consistently. I haven't found a system that does it to a level that I'm happy with quite yet. So that's always a difficulty in automating anything because I've been doing it discretionarily for so long that I know what I want it to identify for me consistently, and I just haven't found that yet. And, and maybe that, that, that is out there, but for right now, I haven't found anything that, that is going to work for me consistently that I'd be pleased with. Not to mention, you know, I think the psychological levels are very powerful, while Fibonacci levels, you know, again, which Fibonacci levels would I, would I use? Because I utilize a number of Fibos. Here, let me use the chart here. I, use a, I utilize a number of Fibos, so I don't know that I would want each and every Fibonacci level to be respected as a potential profit target. You know, you can see how many I use. So then when I would go to the next process of, okay, let's say I did find a, a process by which I was comfortable with the identification of the last major move. Okay, then I got to take the next step which is, do I use the 23.6, the 38.2, the 50, the 61.8, the 78, you know, how, which ones do I use? Which ones don't I use? You know, so for now, until I can find a consistent methodology that I'm happy with, and I think some of that will be testing, um, you know, for now I'm going to have to leave Fibonacci out. However, for those of you that do like Fibonacci, you know, again, that's where that, having that manual input as part of the EA will be, I think, very helpful. And again, remember, you know, I'm certainly not an EA expert, but what I am an expert in is the way that I trade. And what, I'm, what my, my, my journey here for the past two months has been, has been trying to show you how I'm actually in many ways struggling with how to take what I do manually and, and turning it into an automated process. And it's been very difficult. It's interesting how many things, it, it, I think it's a process by, by which you discover things about yourself and things about your trading that you sometimes kind of, I don't know, kind of pushed to the, to the unconscious or subconscious level. Because every aspect of your decision making process when you're describing to somebody what your EA is going to be, you, you've got to really consciously 
consider everything that you do because all those little those little gems, all those little details become part of the EA. And what it's forced me to do, I think, has been really positive, which is kind of deconstruct and then reconstruct how I trade. And it's been a very fun and um, challenging process. You know, again, uh, we started this journey in March, the beginning of March, with my basically telling you this is the first time I'm, I'm going into this. I'm sitting down with programmers who are uh, basically asking me the questions or I'm asking them the questions, which will allow me to replicate myself. That's, that's the best way that I can describe it. And I don't know, it might be an epic fail. I don't know. I've been trying to be as transparent about the process as I can, uh, showing you everything, you know, as all the, all the pitfalls, all my oversights, the things that I do want it to do, the things that I don't know how to do. You know, it's just been a process. So the end result sometime next month, you guys will get to see, and obviously I'm sure I'll hear, hear some feedback about, you know, ways we can do it better. And again, it's specifically a trend-following EA that I'm, that I'm working on, utilizing tools that I already know inside out, which is my wave and my grab candles, and using them to identify the trend, to identify the entry and the exits. So they're in line with the swing trading strategies that I've been outlining for years, not only here at IBFX, but you know, in, in all the different places that I write. So that's, that's been really the, uh, the process. And I'll tell you, it's, it's definitely been an interesting one. I have a whole new respect for, for programmers. I have a whole new respect for systems traders because it's a, it's a very introspective process for sure. It's been humbling to say the least. All right, so, so in terms of where I'm at right now from the risk management side, from the, from the profit target side. Obviously, we're going to have manual overrides, but a lot of it's going to be based upon the wave and psychological levels, levels that I think are easy enough to identify, levels that, that I use with great regularity and that I trust. Okay? And again, even though I used a triangle pattern for example of point of validity, this will be a trend following tool. Okay? Be a trend following tool. All right. So again, um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up our discussion here because I can feel my, my throat starting to really get scratchy. Um, we'll make up that session from last week. If you guys have any questions at all, and, and I appreciate all the questions and, and, and feedback and so forth, I really do. If you guys have taken the time to type something out, I certainly do respect it. Um, please be patient with me, though, because my email box is just jam full. But you can send me an email, comment, question, uh, something I can do better, topic you want to hear, to ragi.horner at ibfx.com. You know, keep in mind, I certainly don't, put myself out here to be an expert on all things. I'm not. I know what I do in terms of my strategies, and that's the only, I think, thing a teacher can teach, the things that they do and the things that they know. And I try not to speak about anything in between. So this last two months has been interesting for me because I am absolutely, admittingly clueless about systems and EAs in terms of my experience level. You know, I know them from a book sense. I've read books about them. And I have friends that are systems traders and so forth. But this is my foray into it. So, you know, warts and all, you guys are you guys are seeing it. So again, I, I appreciate the advice from people who have traveled this road before. Uh, it's certainly I've been taking notes during our time here the last two months, uh, as much as maybe some of you have been taking notes about what I've been rambling on about. So. It's definitely been a mutual, hopefully been a mutually beneficial time for everybody. If you have any questions about the strategies, we've got plenty of video at the YouTube channel, uh, Daily Trading Edge. Of course, you have my email here. You can follow me at Twitter. You can follow me on Facebook, whatever you want. I'm available in a number of ways to keep the discussion going. Thank you to each and every one of you that typed in questions for me. 
I sincerely ap appreciate it. Um, for those of you that have ideas and want to share your experience, just shoot me over an email. It's much appreciated. So in May, by the way, let me give you a quick uh, update. For May, we're going to go back to basics. We're going to go back to uh, kind of a, a 4X 101, or at least my strategies 101. So if you're unfamiliar with my, my, my strategies, my tools, and, and so forth, next month, May, is going to be kind of a, a review month for those of you that are new to all this. So if you want to catch up on my swing trading, trend reversal trading, breakout breakdown trading, inside the range trading, what grab candles are, the 34 EMA waves, psychological levels, Fibonacci, all that stuff, we're going to go back to basics throughout May. So hopefully I will see you then. Thank you for your time as always. Thank you for your questions and for your advice. And I will see you all next month, okay? All right, again, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully when the EA comes out, you guys can tell me what you think. All right? Take care, my friends.